So here we go into week two of our series on what's known as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the prayer and the sequence of things that Jesus taught people to pray for and about when he taught uh, his original disciples in the most famous uh, sermon uh, that we've been studying in the book of Matthew called the Sermon on the Mount. We've been calling this month, it's five weeks in total, we've been calling it the Prayer Revolution uh, not only because we think that learning how to pray the way Jesus taught how to pray will revolutionize our prayer life, whether we have one or we feel good about it or, or we don't have one at all, um, but because so much of the Lord's Prayer prays into a way of life, we actually feel like uh, this study on the Lord's Prayer can not just change our prayer lives, but ultimately change the way that we live, that this literally could be revolutionary uh, in your life and mine. So we're really excited about this and diving back into it this morning. Last week, uh, if you were snowed in, uh, we launched in to the Lord's Prayer, understanding what Jesus means when he encourages people to begin praying by saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And there were kind of a couple, there was a kind of a coupling of two ideas uh, to first of all consider that um, you know, when we pray to God, God's not a police officer trying to give us a ticket. We're not headed to the principal's office to get in trouble. God actually looks at us as a loving spiritual parent. And we can approach him in that way. And then after appreciating who he is, we can acknowledge who he is. We can, we can worship him. That's what hallowed be your name is all about. Worshiping him and crediting him for his attributes, his characteristics. Because we learned last week that's what a a name represents. It's not just a label. It's a description of the essence of who you are. And so we learn to launch into prayers in that way. And following that introduction, Jesus teaches us to pray this way, recorded in Matthew 6, verse 10, where he says, you know, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Then he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the portion of the Lord's Prayer uh, that we're going to study this morning. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And again, there's kind of a coupling of ideas. And so we're going to separate them into, into the two constituent parts. And we're going to start with the first part, the first half, where Jesus teaches people to pray, your kingdom come. And try to figure out what, what that means. Now, I will admit that the language of God's kingdom in church and in Christian circles, especially these days, it seems, is used so pervasively that it's almost lost its meaning. It's, it's, it's sort of the equivalent to the hockey player in the intermission who's interviewed, who says, well, you know, we just got to get the feet moving, got to get pucks to the net. Like they just, they just whistle that off as if it doesn't mean anything. And that's all you hear all the time. And and in a sense, it can lose its meaning. Same thing with this terminology of God's kingdom. So I thought for today, especially if we're new, um, we're going to kind of start with first things first. Sort of start at the beginning here. A kingdom, by definition, is a society where the people of it acknowledge the leadership of a king. End of story. That's what a kingdom is to... Uh, not acknowledge the leadership, the reign, the rule of a king is to not be part of a certain kingdom. And to become a part of a kingdom is to desire and then to place yourself under the allegiance and under the, the, in submission to that king, that leader to allow them to, to lead you. And, and really that's what we're talking about when it comes to God's kingdom, except in Jesus' day, First century Jews would have had a much more sophisticated understanding of God's kingdom because of the way it was talked about and promised so frequently in the Old Testament scriptures. In fact, God's kingdom didn't just mean a society where people would commonly allow God to be king. It meant so much more because of that. See, in that society, as the scriptures described, when God was allowed to finally be king... His ideals were going to be administered in that society. Meaning in this society known as God's kingdom, everything was going to function the way God originally and always intended it to be. 
And so it was kind of forecast as a promised coming day to Jews for centuries who would in their brokenness and fallenness and in the struggle of their lives anticipate that one day they could experience God's kingdom coming. This new society of people who were allowing God to be their king, but more importantly, could experience the healing The release from struggle and oppression, the forgiveness, the freedom of new and fresh and ideal life the way God always intended. That's the sense of hope that people had when they heard the terminology of God's kingdom. And what's even cooler to appreciate is the way that they would have understood this in the real time era of the teachings of Jesus. Because Jesus, when he began his teaching ministry, introduced it this way as recorded in a different bio, uh, biographical account of Jesus written by Mark. In Mark 1.15, Jesus says this, the time has come. He says, the kingdom of God has come near. And what Jesus was explaining was that this promised kingdom, not just this new society of people who were going to enjoy the leadership of God as king, but who are going to enjoy the benefits of it, the life as it ought to have always been kind of benefits. That wasn't just coming one day. That was actually coming real time in Jesus. Because first century Jews understood that the way in which God was going to deliver this kingdom was through a promised Messiah, was through a savior that he was going to send to administer and to facilitate the kind of emergence of his kingdom. And that's what Jesus announced. He said, the kingdom is coming, and that's, he describes it as good news. Now, in their era then, and in ours still today, um, that makes the, di- the dynamics of God's kingdom a little bit confusing. Because on the one hand, Jesus came to earth and died and rose again to enable God's kingdom to come, as we just read. And in many ways, we talk very regularly, especially in environments like this, about the difference that the work of Christ can make in your life and how if you allow Jesus to be your forgiver and leader and begin to embark on a journey of following him, you can experience some of that and even more of that in increasing ways in your life. Some of that healing, some of that release, some of that freedom, some of that new life the way God always originally intended our lives to be lived. But at the same time, Jesus didn't just die and rise again. He ascended to heaven with the promise of coming back one day. And the scriptures teach that it's only on Christ's return that the full kind of final consummation, the, the, the full completion of this building and developing and establishment of God's kingdom on earth will actually occur. And so in our era, and the same as in Jesus' era, beginning with the the existence of Jesus and the usherance of the kingdom back then, we find ourselves in kind of this two-pronged dynamic of God's kingdom where it is already being able to be experienced to some degree and not yet fully able to be perfectly enjoyed. It's what biblical scholars describe as an already not yet Reality. That's the dynamic of God's kingdom where we find ourselves today. And I don't say that to create all kinds of undue and added complication. I say that so that we understand what Jesus means to his original hearers when he encourages them to pray, your kingdom come. Because he's already declared, remember, that the kingdom is coming. And the scriptures have already promised that, you know, when this... Messiah returns one day, the kingdom will be established fully. These are already, in that sense, biblical facts. And Jesus isn't getting people just to pray facts. He's not just saying, you know, pray our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, the sky is blue, the grass is green, like just stated facts. He's actually giving people, get this, he's giving people the opportunity to influence the degree in which the kingdom actually comes by appealing to God for his kingdom to come. And in the already not yet dynamic where they and we today find ourselves, there are really two ways that we're praying that prayer. 
In the already coming dynamic of God's kingdom, we can pray that God's kingdom would come more. That we would be able to experience more of the work of Christ, more of God's ideal, more of the way that things ought to be. More healing, more freedom, more release from struggle and oppression and brokenness and pain and sin. And at the same time, that not yet reality means that we can also pray in that God's kingdom would come sooner. That Christ would return sooner and set this whole thing up more fully, more per perfectly, more completely, and more immediately. And so to pray your kingdom come is actually to pray, God, I want your ideals of this new society where people are acknowledging you as king. I want your ideals, this quality of life, to come faster and to be experienced in the meantime to a greater degree. And all I want us to appreciate in this is that God actually invites us, broken, fallen, human, sin-soiled people like you and me, to appeal to him to influence the degree and the rate at which his kingdom comes on earth. That's just astounding if you stop and actually process that because this kingdom is God's ultimate dream. It's life the way God always and originally designed it to happen. And he invites you and I, little old you and I, to pray his dream to come true to a greater degree. It's actually kind of staggering if you stop and, and reflect on that and process the fullness of what Jesus means when he encourages people to pray, your kingdom come. It's really a remarkable opportunity that God gives us to experience more of his ideal in our lives simply by praying into it. Which then, if you think about it, kind of makes the second half of the coupling that we're studying today feel, I guess at one level, a little bit redundant. Because the back half of Matthew 6 in verse 10 says your kingdom come, and then it says your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the other half. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you think about it, the the appeal to God that his will, that his ideals, that his vision would be done, would happen, would be implemented on earth as it is in the spiritual realms. Well, in a lot of ways, that's synonymous with what it means to see God's kingdom come, isn't it? Because to see God's kingdom come is to see a society who in increasing ways is allowing God to be king, is allowing God to have influence, is in a sense allowing God's will, his wishes, his dream, his vision to happen, to be done on earth. And so your kingdom come is kind of synonymous with your will being done on earth as it is in heaven. And in a sense, you might think that Jesus is just maybe being redundant or restating things just for emphasis sake. But as I read the, the verse and, and this part of the Lord's prayer, I, I don't think that that's completely what Jesus is getting at. Because I think that there are some slight, subtle, but very significant nuances here that I don't want to be lost on us. Personally, I think that when he's encouraging people to pray your kingdom come, that's a more depersonalized, kind of a macro level prayer. It's a prayer kind of on behalf of society, desiring for God's kingdom to come and his ideals to be you know, exuded and lived out in our world to a greater degree. But to pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is, in a lot of ways, a lot more personal. You know, to pray your kingdom come is to pray that people, to a greater degree, would allow God to be king and experience the benefits of it. To pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in a sense, is to pray that I would allow God to be king to a greater degree. And that his vision, that his ideals, that his dreams would be truer in my life than they are today. And I feel that in part because of the way Jesus talked about these two dynamics outside of the Lord's Prayer. You see, Jesus spent a lot of time talking about the coming kingdom, casting the vision for what the kingdom of God is like, giving people all kinds of neat metaphors to understand what life in the kingdom would be like. And we're going to kind of evaluate and reflect on some later this morning. But when he talked about the kingdom, he talked about it kind of in societal terms. But there were times where Jesus also made the, the other comment, said the other half of that prayer, the your will be done on earth as it is in heaven part. Only there he wasn't talking about society, he was talking about himself. 
Like for example, when in fulfilling his mandate as savior of the world, he hung on a cross and was tortured and bled and died. And before he did, in Luke 22, we hear Jesus pray this in verse 42. He says, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, meaning take this pain, take this agony, take this suffering away from me, make it go away. Then he says, yet not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. And what Jesus realized, and in a sense why he prayed that prayer, didn't pray your kingdom come in there, although I'm sure he meant it. What Jesus realized was that even as savior, if society was going to experience all of the wonder of the promised coming kingdom, it was going to require people, and more specifically him, to allow God even in his darkest hour to allow God to be his king, to allow God's wishes, God's ideals, God's dreams, God's vision to trump his even when his urges and desires were the most desperate. And what I want us to notice today is the way in which I believe Jesus deliberately connects those two facets of, in some sense, the same prayer. The fact that he combines the your kingdom come perspective and all the benefit of what a life enjoying God's ideal could bring with the other side, the more personal side, the your will be done on earth as it is in heaven side. Because I feel like it's no accident that Jesus combines those into one single prayer. One aspect of this prayer he teaches people to pray. I feel like this morning, if, if there's ever a stop the presses moment in our life of faith, it, it, it might actually be right now. Because of what it means to combine those ideas together. What it means to combine the blessing and the opportunity of the wonder of God's ideal in his kingdom coming with the responsibility and personal application of making God your king and being able to pray and live your will be done in my life on earth as it is in heaven. I say that because so often feels like in the 21st century North American church, we've actually communicated two distinct options, two distinct invitations of Jesus. And many times in churches, even like ours, we will uh, kind of pre present the upside of life in the kingdom. We may not use that language, but we'll talk about the difference that Jesus can make and what it's like to allow Jesus to be your forgiver and to invite Jesus into your heart to be your savior, to set you free and, and to cleanse you of your past and to reconnect you with God so that you can enjoy eternity in heaven and all the blessings of Jesus work in your life today, which is really all a bunch of kind of spiritual mumbo jumbo to be describing the emergence of the kingdom in a person's life. We invite people to experience the your kingdom come dynamic by allowing Jesus to be their savior. But sometimes we forget and sometimes it's only, you know, later on if we ever get to it, only when a person takes their faith more seriously that we present them with the other side of that and try to kind of renegotiate the life of faith at that point about whether or not they'll actually make the commitments and sacrifices for Jesus to be what the scriptures call our Lord, our leader, our king, and to actually have control and influence over what we do, over what we value, over what we prioritize, and how we think and the way that we live. We'll take the free stuff of Jesus being our savior. We'll take all the upside and the benefit and the blessing, but the the cost of actually allowing Jesus to have that kind of weight of influence in my life. I'm not, I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready to get to know him or get to know the scriptures or believe that the scriptures are relevant for my life or that they're God's written word where Jesus was his living word. I'm not, I'm not into all that. I'm just into Jesus being my forgiver and kind of saving me for heaven one day and blessing me in the meantime. And gang, we got to appreciate on a morning like this that that isn't the invitation of Jesus at all. 
that Jesus never walked the earth and cast two different invitations. He only ever cast one. It sounded like this, follow me. Jesus invited people to follow him, which presumes that he is being allowed to lead them, to be their leader, their influence. And people who became his followers have been able to become his followers because of his death and resurrection, because of the work that he did on the cross, because he wants to play the role of savior in your life and mine. But Jesus plays the role of savior, not as an end, but as a means to the end so he can be our leader. And he can deal with the junk in our lives that inhibits us from relating to God so that we can relate to God as king. And Jesus never intended for the invitation to enter God's kingdom to be separate from the invitation to live in a way where God is king. The two go hand in hand. And so I want us to reflect on that today as we think about the ways where perhaps we unknowingly have prayed for God's kingdom to come or ways in which we could pray to a greater degree for God's kingdom to come and ask ourselves whether we've been equally as interested for God's will to be done in our lives in those ways. You know, we can pray for God's kingdom to come in the ways that we pray for you know, financial provision for God to be a faithful provider and to find us work and to afford us financial opportunities or if we're more charitable or compassionate to, to alleviate, you know, world hunger or global poverty. We can pray those kinds of God's kingdom come prayers. But are we prepared to, to make money the way that God intends, to handle money, to give money, to set money aside, to invest in things, to live simply, to be sacrificial, to be generous, all in the ways that God through the scriptures describe. Are we prepared to see God's will be done on earth when it comes to how we handle our finances? You know, similarly, we can pray for God's kingdom to come in our families. We can pray for thriving families, you know, for great family relationships, but are we prepared to allow God to be king and to allow his will to be done in the way that we select a partner, parent our kids, develop values and anchor our families in certain choices and routines and rhythms that allow God the opportunity to pour out that kingdom blessing. You know, are we allowing God to be king in that way? You see what I'm saying? We, we can pray the upside that God's kingdom would come and be experienced in our society and even in our own lives to a greater degree. But are we equally as prepared to pray that God's will would be done in our lives to a greater degree as it is in heaven? Are we equally as prepared to allow him to be king? You know, it's one thing I was thinking this week with the stress and turmoil in uh, Ukraine to pray for world peace. I can pray for God's kingdom to come and for world peace to pervade to a greater degree, but am I prepared for God's will to be done and to be a more peace-promoting person, to be kinder, to be more patient, to be more forgiving, to engage in conflict resolution, to talk more properly you know, to and about people? Now, am I prepared to allow God to be my king to a greater degree if I'm prepared to pray that his kingdom would come to a greater degree? You get where I'm going with this? And I, I, I'll promise you, th this is not an easy prayer to pray, especially in those areas of our lives where it matters most, where we would most want God's kingdom to come. It often demands the most from us to reflect on whether we will allow God to be king in our lives and allow his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven to a greater degree. That's why in a lot of ways Jesus makes it a prayer because we've got to appeal to God to help us and to give us the capacity to allow that to happen. Seen this recently with a friend of mine a few months ago. Uh, went in for some standard tests on some swollen lymph nodes. Only to find out that he had low-grade lymphoma. Which in English means that the doctor called him and told him that he had cancer. When you get told for the first time that you have cancer. Um, this probably won't surprise you, but 
you start to pray. You probably pray more than you've ever prayed before. And so do your loved ones who are equally in shock and are devastated as much as you. And with this friend, that was the case. And you know, a number of friends and family have rallied around him for the last number of months and prayed along with him. What's been fascinating to watch, though, has been that consistently in the environments that I've been in with him, he's only prayed one prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And on the kingdom come side, he's unapologetically, and I'm unapologetically praying that God's healing and his release from sickness and illness and pain and cancer would be able to be experienced, not just in a more general way, but specifically in this friend's life. Praying for that unapologetically. But to hear him be, you know, more than he's excited about the diagnostic report he got a couple weeks ago that gave as good a news as you could get outside of complete recovery from it. Uh, outside of a complete cure. He's got as good a, a, diag- a diagnosis right now as you could get, which are, and in my opinion, answered prayers. More than being excited about that, he's been consistently excited to share about the opportunities that God's given him to have conversation and enter in a relationship and talk about spiritual matters and life and death and you know, really significant things in ways that he's never had before. And the opportunity that God's given him to have an impact and live with a purpose that for a person who's wanted to get out of bed and live with a kingdom-minded purpose for much of his life, he's living with more of a purpose today than he ever has before. Because what he wants is for God's purposes, God's will, God's agenda to be done in his life. He's not just treating God as a vending machine to heal him. He's treating him as his king. And so my question this morning is not so much in what ways would you like to see God's kingdom come in your life to a greater degree, but more specifically, in what ways are you prepared to allow God to be your king to a greater degree? Because Jesus never invited us into two choices, into two stages. He's given us one invitation and today he's given us one prayer to pray or one prayer to pray. That his kingdom would come and his will would be done in our lives, in our church, in our world, as it is in heaven. As we close today, we're going to reflect on this through some images of the kingdom that we see in scripture that have been brought to life by an artist in our community as part of this arts initiative that we've done throughout this month of this prayer revolution. And as we consider these images that our local host pastors are going to walk us through, Let's consider those areas of the kingdom, those areas of our lives where God is challenging us to the greatest degree to surrender ourselves and open us up to allow him to be king, to allow his will to be done in our lives as it is in heaven so that we can see his kingdom in those ways happen to a greater degree. And in this prayer revolution, let's not just make this our prayer. Let's make this our way of life as God brings those dreams and those prayers to reality. Let's bow our heads together. God in heaven, we come to you today thankful that you are our father, that you love us as a parent and honoring you and worshiping you for who you are, for your great name. And today, God, we pray for your kingdom to come and for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in each of our lives, I pray that you would, by your spirit, in a way that only you can, speak to our hearts right now and point out those areas where we need to pray that most. Where on the one hand, we most need to see your healing, your release, your freedom, your wholeness, your joy, your abundance burst through and areas where we need to relinquish ourselves over to a greater degree for you to be our king. Give us the courage and the confidence to allow you that weight of influence in our lives, knowing how faithful and awesome you are, which is why we start 
by acknowledging your parental love and your worthiness of character so that you by your spirit in answering our prayers can give us the strength just to pray and then to live in this way. So we, as we consider now how we can do that, point those areas out in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. For Jesus' sake we pray, amen.